demonstration of miniature waltz by Lancaster Renfro. It comes from Alfred's Group Piano for Adults, Book 1, page 33. It's an excellent first repertoire piece for you to learn. We'll talk through my musical learning pyramid. We'll add details to build it up to sound very stylistic of waltz. I'm going to play it one more time. I want you to listen if you hear any differences from this performance demonstration compared to the first time. thinking, oh, that was different in terms of the volume, the dynamic shaping, some articulation, maybe some rubato. So I'm going to talk through how to get those details in there. So avoid thinking, oh, this is just a simple piece. All I have to do are the notes and rhythms, but you would be missing all of the style and mood to make it a really true, beautiful repertoire piece. So let's get started. We're going to talk through the style and mood first to set some goals, and we'll work up to that point. The style and mood comes from many things, such as the title, um, a tempo, or if you have a stylistic marking, knowing what type of musical time period this piece was inspired by. So the waltz is the main emphasis for our style and mood. A waltz is almost always in a 3-4 time signature, which informs our rhythm. We know that a waltz has a heavier emphasis on beat one. This is a dance, that's where they would take a little heavier step, and beats two and three are softer. About some articulations later to make that even lighter. Waltzes also come from the Romantic time period. Composers such as Chopin love to write stylized waltzes. So many of the things we'll talk about today will be things that you'll consider when you play a Chopin waltz as you become more advanced. Okay, so let's go off of the style and mood, go to the bottom layer of our musical learning pyramid. We'll look at the rhythm. So I've mentioned the time signature of the waltz is 3-4, something you're getting familiar with. Also, I look for repetitive rhythmic patterns. I see many groupings of three quarter notes and then dotted half notes. We'll talk about how to shape those in a little bit. Let's next go to our note reading to get you guys learning this. Look at your key signature first. I have one sharp. We go up a half step. That would be in the key of G. You can warm up on your G five finger scale. Or if you know it, your G octave scales. some other videos you can check out to learn those scales along with me. Okay, once we've looked at our key signature, let's start looking at our landmark notes. If I look at my left hand first, I identify that I have a landmark middle C. Finger two in the left hand would go on that. And then I see that I also play a step above it. When those notes are together, I play this a harmonic interval at the same time. So keep your hands set there. Scan through for the highest and lowest notes to see if I have to move my hand. In the left hand, looks like the highest note is a D. It's very frequently played. The lowest note would be a G. The first place I get that is like major six. So I'm in a five finger scale. I never move, so stay within that hand position. In the right hand, let's look for landmark notes. Major one, I notice I have a treble C, and I start on a step below it on that B. Again, look for highest notes. The right hand looks like major six is the highest pitch. Lowest pitch would be measure four on a G. It never moves. So you're set within a G five finger scale. Hopefully a position that's comfortable. You wouldn't have to watch your hands at all. So keep your eyes on the scores. We're gonna add lots of details. All right, along with note reading, I look for patterns, scales. If I see lines based line like in the first measure, I know those are stepwise motions. So you have to pay attention to those intervals that are larger than a second where it jumps down a fourth. I look for any kind of chord outlines with all skips. I don't see any of those, so it's primarily a scalar piece with a few intervals in there. So we won't go through all of it, but I would suggest you go through just even hands separate. Think right hand up by steps, down a four, repeats that note, up a second. You can even go through and label those intervals that are larger than a second to help you be successful on right hand note reading. In the left hand, if you have this book, you'll notice that there's lines below the left hand. That's for you as the student to fill in the intervals. I have another interval video so you can get, get used to what these feel like and what they sound like. First, our second major actually is a second. Major four is a third, space to space. Major five is a fourth. Major six is a fifth. So you can go through, you can even jot down and check what I have on the score. So take some time there, get that comfortable. You can tap your foot along to get those um, intervals and note reading comfortable within a fluent tempo. Okay, let's go up to our next level of our musical learning pyramid 
the articulations. This is where a lot of the style starts to come out at this layer. So I notice on my score, all my composer gives me are slurs. Remember when I have slurs and one ends? Disconnect it, then the next one. ideas, just like you would put punctuation in uh, while you would speak. The left hand doesn't have anything for articulation. So if you look at the score that I've provided for you, this is informed from the waltz. Second and third beats are light and soft, so I've drawn in staccatos when they appear in the second and the third. Staying very close to the keys to get that light articulation. So you could play some left hand alone. Then if we look at the second and fourth lines, and I have intervals that appear on the downbeat, beat one. But I notice that the D repeats. In the piano, those hammers are striking, so I need to lift my fingers up off the keys, if you can stay on the surface of the key, to replay the interval. So I've drawn in commas to remind you, you have to lift it. Here's major five, four, one, two, three, lift, two, lift, two, three, rest. We'll keep those nice and light. So practice the left hand by itself to get those staccatos and those lifts. And then a hands together step rather than just trying to jump, and that can be hard for a beginner. Trying to do some tapping along gets rid of those kind of fine motor skills to start. So I'm gonna play the right hand. I'm gonna just tap the left hand. That way I can get used to left hand lifting and right hand staying smooth. Here's the first two lines. so you can hear kind of a wrong way and then the right way so you can listen for that in your playing. Here's where they both lift together. It really disrupts that beautiful right hand line. Let me play it with the right hand smooth and the left hand um, articulated underneath it. Much more beautiful. You can check out a video with voicing and articulation contrast practice be able to do it in pieces like this. Okay, so now that we've got our articulations figured out, the slurs and the staccatos, you can pause it there and practice it. Once that's secure, we're going to go up into the dynamics, where they become even more stylistic. So on the score, all I see are really two dynamic markings, mezzo piano, mezzo forte, and a few hairpin crescendo de crescendos on the second line, and also the retardando at major 15 with the de crescendo at the end. But I'm going to add more. So we want to go back to the waltz. Our downbeat is emphasized, so I'm going to start that a little heavier and pull it away into major two. So I've drawn de crescendos to bring it back away from the downbeat. That will contrast the longer line at five. Our crescendo, here's the goal, bring it back. Okay, there's a repetition, so the editors, and I agree, have made it a little bit richer. Pull it away. through some of those other dynamic markings that I've decided to add. I like to add phrase variety. If you have repetitive patterns, don't play it the same way every time. So the first marking is mezzo piano. When it repeats at three to four, it's down lower, so you can play it a little softer. And it sneaks in. Mezzo forte. Now on this repetition, even though it's lower, it's our second time, I'm going to play it more intense. I'm going to play major nine again. to talk about with the dynamics, which you've probably been hearing all the way through, is voicing, meaning playing one part louder than the other. A simple way to think about this is I ask my students, what part would you hum along with? And they'll say, oh, definitely the right hand. So you could voice the right hand louder. I have some videos on voicing, but we talked about silent playing. So I'm going to play my right hand. It's going to tap on top of the keys to get that silent. then I can go back and play the left hand lightly. Notice I even slowed down so I can really listen to that. Work on these skills at a slow tempo, even slower than I'm playing today, and then build it up so you can be confident on that. All right, now we've arrived at the fun style and mood category of this. 
since it is a waltz, probably from the romantic time period since it's cantabile in nature, we could also add some rubato, which is an expressive tempo. So there's this an ebb and flow. It doesn't have to be literally danced to, but it can be a stylized kind of feeling. So I'm gonna play it through one more time so you can hear all of those skills put together and you can hear some rubato as well. Enjoy. you to use that musical learning pyramid. If you compared that performance to even my first one, I think that one sounds even better because I had to go through the stages to think about all of the details. So use that for your learning, be patient with it, and enjoy the end results. Thank you.